I remember the first time I grew cardiac tissue in the lab. At first,、um, they looked like little mini marshmallows, actually. <laughs> But then, after a few days, they began to dance in their dish. It was amazing. I remember、uh, hooking up my stimulator circuit and peering down into the oculars of my stereoscope and watching them as they danced. I turned the dial on the stimulator and watched them slow down and speed up and keep up with the beat. It looked like magic. But actually, maybe the more correct word would be a trick, because you know, like a lot of magic tricks, there's really just you know a non-obvious and simple. You know, reveal, right? And in this case, it was that we were copying the natural heart rhythm that those heart cells would have felt in the body. Okay, and this is called the biomimetic paradigm. And we, as tissue engineers and people in the regenerative medicine field, have gotten a lot of mileage out of this concept. This is the heart tissue.、Um, and right now,、um, I'm part of a startup called Epibone, where we're using the same principle towards growing、uh, human personalized bones. To hopefully revolutionize skeletal reconstruction. Now you can imagine it's not electrical signals that we're copying. We're copying the flow of nutrients and the, the biomaterials to mimic what's happening in the body.、Um, but this this paradigm's the same: copying from nature's playbook, stealing from nature's playbook. And of course, our field has has made great strides with growing everything from liver to lung, you know, and and, and so on. Okay, but what I'd like to talk to you about today is how actually I think this is part of a much broader picture. Okay,、uh, what's been really interesting to me over the past few years is seeing how people in fields as diverse as art and architecture and cuisine and and have been in a way stealing from our protocol binders. Okay, and and as diverse as they are, the one thing they have in common is that they're asking this question: Can we do fill in the blank with cells? So I'd like to introduce you to a few of these people. Meet Suzanne Lee. She's a UK-based fashion designer, and she uses a kombucha-like slurry of bacteria and yeast and sugar to engineer what she calls vegetable leather that she's used to make everything from from shoes to jackets.、Um, meet Andras Forgox. He's the CEO of a company called Modern Meadow, based in New York City, where they use tissue engineering techniques a lot like what we use in the lab to grow meat and leather. Skipping. Skipping growing、uh, fields of grass to feed the cows that we use for these things. Okay, this is a husband and wife couple, Oren Katz and Yonatsur, <laughs> and they actually started a biology lab dedicated to bio art in Australia. And they're very ironic. This is a piece、um, called Pig Wings. They asked the question if pigs could fly, what would their wings look like? And they grew them. <laughs> they actually grew them in、um, green and blue as well. <laughs> And meet Ingmar Rydell Cruz. He's a bioengineer, actually from Stanford,、um, who used electrical signals a lot like what I used in the lab with my heart tissues,、um, and hooked them up to a joystick. <laughs> and lo and behold, got paramecia to change the directions in which they were swimming, and said, "Well, why not make that into a video game?" This is a game inspired by the '80s classic Breakout.、Um, incidentally. A class on teaching people how to build biotic video games out of off-the-shelf hardware、um, and open-source hardware was taught at a do-it-yourself DIY biology laboratory in Brooklyn, New York. Okay, you're like, what is that? It's a biohacking space. It's a gym membership model for biology. Can you believe these places exist? It's amazing.、Um, so you pay a hundred bucks a month, and you can do whatever art or science you'd like to do there. Okay, within, you know, the board has to approve. But really, there's so much freedom. To experiment with using science, but without being bound by the scientific method. Okay, so I hope I've impressed you with you know the range of things you can do with cells. But I also hope that you've gotten a sense of the idea that actually this is becoming much more accessible than it was before because of these spaces, these biohacking spaces. Okay, in other words, biology has a garage, right? And I'm from New York, and I'm an entrepreneur, so I don't drive. So when I think garage, I think. That's where Apple got started. <laughs> That's where you know HP and Dell got started, right? A garage is a place where you start a business, right?、Um, <laughs> and if you expand the idea of garage, I mean,、um, Baby Einstein、uh, was actually started in a kitchen. Okay, so was Gerber, right? So these businesses, businesses have gotten started in the home. Okay, now, now, how do businesses get started in people's homes, in garages, so to speak?、Um, so Baby Einstein, for example, was started when this woman. 
When she, she, was, she wanted to make a prototype, so what did she do? She grabbed a camera from her neighbor, she roped her husband Bill to go down to the basement and film a prototype that they cut and spliced together, right? And now Baby Einstein is a billion dollar, com billion dollar industry, basically, right? Now, how does that happen? Because all of that technology became you know, safe and cheap and small enough to have in the home, okay? And, and so what we're on the cusp of right now, which is really cool to me, is this idea where we can say, for example, in just a couple years, well, you know, I just 3D bioprinted some cupcakes with some bioluminescent frosting, or, or something like this, right? <laughs> but that's actually not too far in the future, because this kit right here on this slide was actually an instructable um, with parts that are less than 100 bucks to put together. Um, that you can just, you know, put it together right now. This was put together by the local biohacking uh, group, BioCurious, um, by the way, love the name. So, um, I hope you've gotten a sense of the, of the broad, you know, the broadness that, of what we can accomplish with, um, when we collaborate with cells as living technologies. Um, and, and you might be asking yourself, what's next? Right? And you can imagine tons of things, like leathers that can outperform what nature can do right now. Or maybe even using electrical fields, like what Ingmar Rydell Cruz is using, um, with Suzanne Lee's bacteria to make living looms. Or maybe we can even imagine choreographed ballets of cardiac tissues. Right? But what I think is more important than asking these questions of what can we do with cells, is asking what should we be doing with cells? Right? And, um, and, and so for this reason, you know, I wanted to show you um, a picture. This is a girl's hands. She's holding a piece of DNA, DNA that we isolated from strawberries earlier that day, by the way. It's not too hard to do. It takes about three minutes and um, some soap and salt and a Ziploc baggie, a little bit of rubbing alcohol, okay? But I can tell you that after these kids isolated DNA and held it in their hands, they were able to have really high-level bioethics debates about things like gene doping or genetic preselection of children or the, the quality of DNA evidence in trials, okay? If we, if my theory is that if more and more of us get a chance to hold DNA in our hands and really experience what it's like to do biology, that we're no longer going to leave um, you know, decisions, important decisions about bioethics to bioethicists alone and politicians, right? Um, I love this quote, we live in a time when if you make it easy for someone to steal from you, someone will, okay? And so when I think about this time and, and all of the broad um, issues that, that biologists who are, whether we're, whether we're biohackers or we are, you know, tissue engineers or if we're architects using uh, living cells, we're all going to be facing similar issues, okay, in terms of platform technologies and scalability and the like. And so when I think about um, what we have in common with the, the last time we faced these kinds of issues, I think, wow, in the first Industrial Revolution, we had the same problem. And we invented things like time zones and, you know, railroad tracks that were the same gauge, right? And in the second Industrial Revolution, when, you know, which you could argue we're in the middle of now, we invented things like um, you know, Wi-Fi protocols and, and ways to perform, you know, internet purchases, right? Platform technologies that serve all by borrowing from each other, right? And so, as we think about cells, this is a Drosophila embryo, for example, <laughs> and one of these days I'll make a coffee table book of these beautiful images from biology. But as we think about, you know, biology as being made of cells, living building blocks, okay? Um, you know, and I think about my little niece, Sonia. This is her playing with Legos. She's making her first choo-choo train at Christmas this year. Um, I think, you know, what about now, okay? When we think about the world that we're creating for these kids, or maybe even more importantly, the world that these kids are creating for us, you know, isn't it exciting to think that the third industrial revolution could be about life? So thank you very much.